we're going through times of extraordinary tumultuous change, and that's not going to stop. If anything, it's going to accelerate and get more profound. And secondly, that calls upon us to think very differently about education, about the talents of our kids, of our, the resource of our faculty. We have to create different institutional structures since most of the systems of education we have now weren't designed to meet the challenges that we're currently trying to confront. I mean, that was the heart of what we're arguing in all our futures. There's something in the culture of education which, which we need to shift. There's a need for a more creative approach to education. There are some obstacles in the way of it, but there's a lot of valiant effort to try and remove them and get on and do something else. So I want to quickly sketch in those things. When you think about the need for creativity in education, firstly, there's a global imperative for this. It, it's absolutely essential, in my view, that we have a different view in education of the depth of the creative talents of the people we work with, of human beings. I mean, human beings are born with tremendous natural capacities. They have a huge appetite for learning and tremendous creative potential. What tends to stop it, ironically, is the conflict between learning and education. If you've got children, or ever were one, you will know that children have a remarkable appetite for learning from the moment they're born, actually before they're born. For example, children learn to speak in the first few years of life. That's a remarkable thing to do. They learn to speak. And the thing is, you don't teach them. It's far too complicated. I mean, they wouldn't have the time and you wouldn't have the patience. You know. <laughs> Your kids don't reach the age of 18 months old and, and then you sit them down and say, look, we have to talk. <laughs> or, or more specifically, you do. And, <laughs> and this is how it's going to work. That doesn't happen. Kids absorb language through their skin. You correct them and you encourage them and you chide them along, but you don't say, look, here's the situation. You know, there are certain noises we've been making, and these refer to things. They're called nouns, and there are other noises which sound very similar, but they're really verbs. They tell us what you can do with these things, which we've just given other sounds to. And, and there are tenses, so you can anticipate what you might do in the future, and you can describe what you have done in the past. And when we invent systems of formal education, the intention behind them, well, it's twofold, really. One is that there are certain things that we want our children to learn that we're not inclined to leave to chance. We think they're too important. And there may be historical things, there may be scientific things, cultural things, but that's, these are the things that we embed in the curriculum. And, and the other is that there are some things we want our kids to learn which are probably too difficult for them to learn if left to their own devices, like calculus. So formal education has its purposes. They're economic, they're social, they're cultural, and they're personal. And the great contest, of course, is what the contents of the curriculum should be and what methods of teaching we should adopt. Now, the reason I'm saying there's a global imperative to think about the place of creativity in all of this is, firstly, that the world is changing more rapidly than ever, partly under the influence of new technologies. I mean, really, in the last 300 years, technology has become a tumultuous influence, and more and more so. And secondly, is population growth. The world is more populated now than any other time in history. And that's a big challenge to all of us. There are now... Seven and a half billion people on the planet, and we're heading for nine billion by the middle of the century, maybe 12 billion by the end of it. And we don't honestly know if, on present trends if the planet can really cope with this. And there's every indication it can't. <clears throat> there was a wonderful program on the BBC a few years ago about how many people can live on Earth. They argued that if everybody on the Earth consumed food, fuel, and water at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of about 15 billion people. So a a, we're sort of halfway to that. But, they said, if everybody on the Earth consumed at the same rate as the average person in North America, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of one and a half billion. So we're way past that now. Uh, so if the whole world wants to live as, as, as we do, as it were, in the advanced economies like us, by the middle of the century, we're going to need five more planets to make this feasible, which we don't have. And all this has been caused by human creativity. The trouble is, we haven't been creative enough. And the curve is becoming exponential, so the need to embed creativity into our education system is economic, it's social, it's cultural, uh, and it's personal. Our current systems weren't designed with these objectives in mind, or at least weren't in, designed to embed creativity in quite this way. So there's a global imperative. There's also a particular imperative for those of you who work in higher education, for higher education to make this adjustment. There are big movements in creative pedagogy. Teaching people um, uh, facts and information uh, is a part of creative pedagogy, but it's not the same thing as. Helping people to open their minds up to new possibilities like this is about framing questions, organising encounters, knowing how collaboration works, knowing how questions can be raised and can be put differently. Um, it's a different type of pedagogy. And I think if we're serious about creativity in higher education, we need to help people who teach in it to teach this way. I think we should be running training courses 
in creative thinking. You can't teach really what you don't know. Uh, there are ways in which we can help teachers themselves become more creative by broadening the compass of their, their creative repertory. There are also many campuses which are recognised the need to have, uh, as it were, sort of a more creative environment. You know, cultural programmes writ large. There's a whole movement in creative campuses because, we, in a way, we have to improve the value proposition for students these days. There has to be some good reason to show up for three or four years at an institution that you don't get through going on to a MOOC. And there's also a recognition that creativity is a function of the culture of the whole organisation. I'm really excited by this. I think there's a, there's, there is a whole movement here to build on. Culture, if it com you think it comes down to habits and habitats, redesigning campus spaces and also redesigning the algorithms of behaviour that run through them. I don't think it's an option anymore. If universities are to play their part in the challenges that we face, they have to grapple with all this. And I say universities, I mean, by the way, I want to mean higher education in general, not just universities, but all the you know, post-secondary education. There was an interesting observation by H.G. Wells in the early 20s, early 1920s, I think, where he said that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. I think it's a start, but a very interesting way to put it. Education is in the front line of our evolution culturally and intellectually as a species and creatively, and I think it's the historic challenge now of our generation to grasp that properly.